Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Dave Farnsworth. He, him pronouns. Welcome to today's webinar entitled, So How Does This Go Again? The Role of Advisory Services in Fleet Electrification. If you would, imagine that you're a fleet manager. You're an expert, a complex set of arrangements that includes planning, budgeting, financing, purchasing, operations, maintenance, and scheduling of vehicles that use fossil fuels. How at the same time are you supposed to understand all of your options for alternative vehicles like electric buses and fuels like electricity? Well, the answer is advisory services, assistance offered by utilities or other companies that's designed to educate and enable consumers like fleet managers or individuals to make informed choices. While available in different models, advisory services have one thing in common. They manage the complexity that is a very real barrier to greater adoption of electric transportation. Now for a moment, imagine that you're a utility regulator. As EV adoption continues in your state, you will increasingly encounter advisory service program proposals from utilities and a greater presence of third party providers offering these services to utilities and fleets. How do you approach these requests? Gauge their value and make sure that they're consistent with other relevant policies. Well, today's webinar is going to explore those questions. My colleague Camille Kadosh will be talking with Timothy Channon, Transportation Director of Twin Rivers Unified School District in McClellan, California. That's a suburb of Sacramento. We'll be hearing from Jason Paquet, Electric Vehicle Strategy and Performance Manager at XL Energy. Ann Shu, PhD, co-founder and CEO of Electro Tempo, Inc. And Matt Stanberry, Managing Director of Highland Electric Transportation, Inc. In response to our panel discussion, we'll also be hearing from Jeff Ackerman, who is a RAP senior advisor and a former Colorado PUC commissioner. Just a couple notes of process. Your mics are muted, so please enter your questions in the Q&A box, not in the chat, in the Q&A box. Um, you heard the announcement, this session is being recorded. Um, and as usual, we plan to run about 60 minutes. However, if participants are still on the line, We'll continue with the Q&A for an additional half hour after that, after the top of the hour. So with that, uh, Camille, the microphone's yours. Thank you, Dave, and welcome everyone. I'm looking forward to a wonderful conversation. We're gonna start our conversation today talking with Tim Shannon of the Twin River School District. There you are. So Tim, in 2017, way back in 2017, the Twin Rivers School District was the first school district in the nation to deploy zero emission electric school buses, thanks mainly to your efforts. That's a lot for one person to undertake. Can you tell us how you came to be part of the Twin Rivers School District's transition to electric transportation? Whoops, you're muted, Tim. Are you muted? There you go, perfect. Okay, great. I have a new computer, so hopefully it doesn't act up. Anyway, really so what had happened was that I became the director of transportation and we had this ancient fleet of buses that were, you could barely and, and able to breathe. Um, so I got introduced to a guy named John Clements. I don't know if anybody knows him. He is known as the electric bus evangelist. And John introduced me to a whole slew of people um, at uh, CARB, at SMUD, and, you know, all the different team players that made this happen. And they asked me, would you be interested in an electric bus? So we went and looked at, he brought, actually, he brought a Lion bus to, to come see us. He also brought a TransTech. At that time, those were the only two electric bus manufacturers on the planet for school buses. So we did some trial runs with it, and we looked at the viability of it, and actually um, uh, mirrored some of our routes behind a diesel bus. Can you imagine being behind a diesel bus? Uh, anyway, so after looking at it, after studying that, you know, there were proven miles um, with Lion Electric out of Canada, there were pro proven miles with the Motive slash Trantec buses, 
um, in um, in Mountain View, the, those were the Google buses that they actually worked. So then we started looking at, well, how could we get some of these and what would it take to get them? So we worked with a lot of people to develop a funding structure. And um, we worked with First Priority at the time and we got a grant writer and we lobbied a lot of people. And we decided that we're not just gonna get one or two, we're gonna get 16. We decided that 20, we could put 29 in Sacramento, but in order to really leverage that grant funding, we were going to have to get some partners in it. So we partnered with two other school districts. Sac City took three, Elk Grove took, um, uh, I believe 10, and we took the remainder. We ended up with 16 is what we ended up with. Um, and then we started running them. And that's really how we got started. But really what is interesting, what comes next? So before we get to the what comes next, I want to understand a little bit of the landscape here for uh, early school districts trying to adopt this. And you had to put things together bit by bit, right? So you've got this diesel, a bunch of diesel buses, and you have this desire to electrify. What are the middle steps? How did you put together this program? What were the different elements that you needed to stitch together? Oh, some of the elements were, one is that we had to determine if we could um, actually operate these buses. Um, do the so we took all our routes, looked at all our routes in our routing software, our new routing software at the time, and realized that we could, with a 100-mile bus, run 97% of all our bus, bus routes. So then we started really optimizing them and realizing, you know what, we could make this really work even better. So we changed bell times, we, we tiered our routes, we, we set it up so we could be really efficient, kind of like what an air traffic controller would do, mm -hmm. you know, in, in setting up some, some routes. Anyway, then we had to partner in, okay, what are we gonna do about electricity? So we had to work with, with our electricity provider. Um, we had to put all those things together. We had to look at, you know, find an engineer to develop our infrastructure. We had to find people that would, could provide chargers that would be sufficient um, with, the, with the grant structure, which was up 281 pages. We had to define who the vendors were going to be, otherwise, we would have to go to, um, to bid on the infrastructure for the district. So we, we did a lot of workarounds and then we had to you know, sell it to the board. I had to sell it to my boss and you know, it, it was a lot. It, we started this project in late 2015. It took over a year to develop it. And Tim, What's your background? Is, is this is this something that you're that so, you've trained your entire life to do to look at elect, uh, electricity and all these things that you need to to understand to electrify? So, tell us about you. So I'm going to tell you it's a it's I don't come from any of that industry. What happened was is that um, I tell everybody I used to bleed Kodak yellow. I came from the photo imaging industry, and and we were one of the first to deploy. Um, scanners that actually in systems that wrote to CD, remember CDs? Well, nobody was writing to them. So it was in its infancy. It's when you had a computer and some of you will know that only read the CDs. They didn't even write to them. So being on that cutting edge or bleeding edge, we were an alpha test site for Eastman Kodak. It was, um, it, it gave me that ability out of the box, take risks. Then the recession happened. We closed our imaging lab. Technology changed. People took pictures with cell phones and not cameras. And I transitioned into actually being the school bus driver for 18 months, threw my resume around, became a supervisor. Then um, I was tapped on the shoulder and asked if I would like to, if, if I was interested in being a director. So I just immersed myself in the school bus industry. And then I went to one of these webinar things, you know, um, 
uh, green energy um, because John was going to have a school bus there and I wanted to see the, the newest lion. Well, I sat down and watched some uh, this presentation on the future and building the grid, vehicle the grid, um, engine transportation. So I was really intrigued. So then I just started reading, you know, perusing the web, talking to whoever I could talk to that knew anything about anything pertaining to electrification. That's excellent. And so you've you've run around, you've put all this team together, all these people looking at grants, financing, the technology, understanding your own situation with your own buses, what the routes are, what the capabilities are, talking to understand all the different elements of um, what the electric buses could do. So you've put this together, you've put together this program. What are the results? What happened? Well, what happened was, is that not only did they function well, of course, we had some, you know, growing pains with the newer technology, but we started reviewing the data. We, we worked with a company that actually was taking, you know, eight of our buses and taking the data from the, the Lion buses. And we were, we were looking at, excuse me, cost per mile. So we were looking at our, our current utility rate. We started saying, wow, after a year, we're only 18 cents a mile for fuel. We're looking at, um, you know, maintenance cost, you know, dropped to um, we 60, minimum of 60%. So inventory became almost zero for the electric buses. And we started doing all those cost comparisons and functionality of the buses. The kids love the buses because they're quiet. The drivers love them. They can have a decent conversation without yelling um, for the environment. So we started checking off all these boxes on the why you would want electric and what's the advantage to it. And we didn't have any boxes of why you wouldn't want to do it. Excellent. So I'm not sure if it was your your Zoom or my Zoom that cut out there, but I think you said you had 80% reduction in fuel costs, 60% reduction in maintenance, and smaller inventory. That's correct. Light bulbs. Anything else that you noticed as an impact of switching? Oh, in, you know, in, in the, the comfort of the ride. I mean, one of the things we did, we put air conditioners in every bus and they run super efficiently and the students were saying, you know, I used to have to ride in 105 degrees home at the end of the school year. Now it's a comfortable ride, quiet, comfortable, and clean. Nice. So you initially started with 16 buses. How have things evolved since 2017? Where are you at now? Well, we, we actually own, but they're spread all the way around because we're, we're upgrading our yard to 82 chargers with... Um, 22 of them being vehicle to, vehicle to grid. So we actually own 52 electric school buses. And um, by the end of, well, as, with, as long as the, the supply chain doesn't interrupt it, um, in a year and a half, we should have 82 uh, functional electric school buses in our fleet. Excellent. 95% of our fleet. Okay. So Tim, you ran around and put all these different elements together. And we've come a long way since 2015, 2016, 2017. So in hindsight, what are the essential elements that other fleet managers who are starting out with their um, with existing buses, what do they need to have to replicate what you did? Well, uh, one is time, <laughs> one is time. Um, if they if they don't have the bandwidth to do all the pieces that we've done and I've done, you know there are other places they could go that offer turnkey solutions now. So states that don't have grant funding like we do in California, um, states that um, cities that you know they don't have a good rapport with their utility or they don't know who to talk to. Um, help ease that pain and basically give them a turnkey solution. Okay. So funding is an element, 
Um, you also worked with, you said with your utility, which is an, a crucial element. Um, what else? I think one is, is networking every group that you can network with. Anybody that could possibly have um, a participation within that project deployment, you need to become basically their best friends. I'm their best friends. You need to um, to work with them, find ways that, and I use this saying all the time, it's the Jerry Maguire saying, let me help you help me. Like we help the air districts meet their goals by deploying clean vehicles. Uh, we help the utilities meet their goal by um, um, putting for load management during those peak days the ability to pull power out when they need it. Those are just some of the things. Just some of the things. Now, I also wanted to highlight one other point that you made earlier was that you mapped your district. You looked at what you needed to do. So you, you brought data to the table and looked at it and said, this is what we have to meet. This is what we need to do. Any other data that you should bring or have in um, mind as you're thinking about this transition? Hey, you, that that's a key thing. Map your district. Know your know your routes. Of your routes. Know um, you know. Are you going to use those buses for field trips? So you're going to do level two charging, or you're going to do DC fast charging. That you know, so you can get that midday charge in order to to meet that field trip needs. I think it's really understanding what your operation is from a um, from an equipment standpoint. And then also knowing what your fuel costs are um, comparative to what your electric costs are, knowing that like in California, we have LCFS credits. So that's gonna offset that, um, that even that additional fuel cost, we're actually gonna run our electric fleet on zero fuel cost. Excellent. So it's knowing those, it's knowing all the components that lead up to it, knowing what you pay per, what it costs you per mile to run, Got it. So thank you, Tim. We've talked about funding, utility, commitment, data, cooperation, coordination, and time to be able to replicate what you did uh, with the Twin Rivers and that others might be interested in. So we're going to switch now that we've heard Tim so ably illustrate what the, what the uh, challenges that fleet managers face. We're going to switch to um, transition to hear how different services can meet these needs. So we're gonna hear from three panelists to talk about different ways to meet the needs that Tim encountered, switching from uh, an existing bus fleet to electrification. So we're gonna hear from Jason Paquet from Excel Colorado. Hello, Jason. Hello. So Jason, you heard what Tim faced, all the challenges, all the different running around that he had to do to connect all these different pieces. How can a utility company such as Excel, who has uh, looked at this issue in depth, how can you help fleet managers like Tim to electrify? Yeah, it's certainly it's a great question. And, and thanks for including Excel Energy in, the, in this conversation. This is something we're thinking a lot about and trying to get the word out about how important all these pieces are, each in their own right, but how to integrate them all together. And that's what I wanted to focus here for a couple of minutes on. So, so when we take a step back and we think about what Tim just shared, right? Tim's a go-getter. He figured out all of this on his own. And that's asking a lot for fleet managers, right? But we have to realize that it, it shouldn't just be on the fleet manager, that there are multiple components here inside any organization when they're thinking about adopting electric vehicles and going down this transportation electrification journey. There are fleet managers that need to be part of the conversation. There are property services managers that, that need to be part of the conversation on the charging and, and parking space side of things. There are finance managers thinking about these new vehicles that have higher upfront costs, as well as the cost of charging equipment and the infrastructure related there. And then lastly, there's also sustainability managers that are a key stakeholder here internally within organizations. And so, you know, I, I don't think anyone else replaces the, the, the fleet or the customer from our perspective who sits at the center of all that, but we have to recognize that there's a lot of different parties involved, all with an important perspective in this process. 
And so with that in mind, we've tried to create a suite of programs that try to address these challenges for fleets, uh, all the items that, that Tim was mentioning. And so I created a, a quick graphic. So this might be a time, a quick time to just, just pop it up on the screen if you're able to. Just showing about showing the 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 path here. So the, the first space, and not necessarily being sequential here, I, I think we're seeing a lot of customers come at this question from various places. But it, to enable full electrification, you know, we see a key role for the utility being fleet advisory on the on the upfront kind of initial side. You need to talk about the distribution grid and, and make ready infrastructure in order to energize these charging stations and sites. Of course, we need to talk about the charging stations themselves. And there's also the electric rate options component of this. You know, if you're Tim though, there are additional elements here too, right? You've got to think about the vehicle itself and the financing of that, which can have higher upfront costs almost in all cases. And then, you know, on the back end, there's also energy management in real time, which Tim was also touching on. So, so we kind of think about this space as, as the starting point, certainly not the ending point, but we've tried to design programs to, to at least fill in these gaps as we move forward, trying to fill in those, those additional elements as well. And so just to dive in a, a little bit briefly here on each one of these, these pieces that need to all come together to enable this hopefully smoother electrification journey for, for fleet customers is you know, starting on, on the left-hand side here, fleet advisory. You know, this is what we did, define as uh, our suitability assessments, right? And so as Tim was talking about figuring out your, what your equipment needs, knowing that equipment well, knowing what can electrify, what routes are good candidates for electrification and which aren't is, is a huge important step of this process. And so we partner with external firms who, who do these types of assessments day in and day out. And so by, by connecting our customer to those resources to provide upfront funding to cover that costs, so that it's free to the customer makes it that much easier. And we can be sure that they're, they're connecting with a, a reputable firm that knows what they're doing. So that's, that's what we kind of see as step one. Okay, now that we've got an idea of, of which fleets, which, sorry, which vehicles are good candidates for electrification, you know, after mapping their routes for, for several months and collecting data, now we can talk about the charging stations and the distribution work needed to support those charging stations. And again, this is a conversation between utilities, their customers, and regulators. Um, you know, we've we've gotten approval for for programs to to not only support the distribution or the grid side of of this infrastructure, which we've been doing for you know over a hundred years in some form of, of another, but can we support make ready investments? These are the the additional wiring, you know, conduit, cabinet work in between. The point of connection or, or the meter and often in, in most cases and the actual charging stations themselves. You know, a lot of uh, state commissions have allowed utilities to make these investments, which, which is fantastic that whatever helps us reduce costs for these fleets and, and other customers considering electrification, you know, the, the better. So, so once we, we get that figured out, we're, we're looking at the charging stations themselves, you know, whether or not that's customers um, procuring their own charging stations, whether or not they want to get those from us. You know, we offer we offer optional charging equipment um, at the level two power capacity for for a low monthly charge. You know, that again, just trying to create turnkey solutions to make this as easy as possible. You know, if customers want to bring their own charging equipment, that's great too. Sometimes we can bring rebates to bear to offset some of those costs. And then, you know, lastly, here on the far right. The electric rates portion of this is, is critical because if customers aren't seeing those savings in real time as they move forward, it's going to make a lot of electrification a whole lot harder considering all these upfront steps and upfront costs in most cases. So we've got to have charging rates that, that make sense that provide time-based or demand-based incentives for customers to charge when it's cheap for them and cheap for the grid. That's the best case scenario and making sure that we've got rates to suit whatever their needs are. So our goal is to put all of this together and make it as seamless as possible. I don't think we've, we've fully cracked the nut yet, right? There are additional elements we need to feed in here on supporting those vehicles themselves, supporting kind of charging optimization beyond that, beyond just rate design, energy management moving forward. 
I think we can increasingly get more and more sophisticated as we go down this journey. But I, I see those four pillars as a, a key foundation to making this easier at this early stage of the market. All right. Thank you, Jason, for sharing this part of the conversation about the utility perspective. And we will come back to you later with some more questions. So we're going to, having heard the utility perspective or one utility perspective, we're going to shift to hear from Matt Stanbury at Highland Electric Fleets to hear how a third party provider can help meet some of the challenges that Tim has articulated. So Matt, you've heard Tim's story and you've heard from Jason on how uh, Excel is proposing to address some of these challenges that Tim, uh, that Tim faced. How does Highland Electric help newbie fleet, fleet managers electrify? Not newbie fleet managers, fleet managers new to electrification take make this complicated transition. Thank you. For the invitation today, Camille. Okay, it was a little garbled. Try again. Hi. Camille, thank you, and thanks to the entire RAP team uh, for uh, the invitation today um, to uh, to join you. Um, and uh, good to see uh, some some friends on the uh, on the panel here. Um, so uh, a little bit of uh, a background, and, and Tim really uh, alluded to uh, some of the challenges that uh, were the impetus for the creation of Highland um, at the beginning. Uh, our, our company was set up a little over four years ago with the observation that uh, Tim's task was really hard. <laughs> um, and uh, really, we were seeing pretty good product from uh, uh, major manufacturers on the road that worked pretty well, the same observation that Tim had. Um, and that you had a lot of demand for alternatives to diesel. That was good because diesel is pretty nasty stuff. Um, and uh, yet you really weren't seeing scale outside of what Tim was doing. Uh, and uh, the, the basic two challenges that we saw were one sort of obvious cost. It just costs too much um, for transportation directors to really think about uh, doing this at scale unless they could get really, really large sums of grant funding. Um, and uh, the second piece was, uh, was more subtle, but uh, maybe more important, which was, it was just too complicated and felt too risky for transportation directors. Tim has an innovation background. Um, he's comfortable with risk. A lot of transportation directors uh, look at this and say, okay, wait, so you've got a new technology um, but I got to dig up my depot while I'm operating it. I got to put a bunch of charging infrastructure in that I don't know anything about. And then I need to use that charging infrastructure to help offset the upfront costs that are associated with these vehicles. No thanks. Uh, because I'm judged at the end of the day on delivering kids safely from school on time every day. Full stop. I'm not a technologist, um, and that's 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 what I have to deliver. And so our, our our observations were that that felt like not a technology challenge. That was a business model and access challenge, and it felt really similar in certain ways to the challenge that faced the residential solar space 15 years ago, uh, before the advent of financing and private en entities helping. Um, uh, get homeowners uh, access to affordable and simple solar. Um, and so we really set up the company to center on those two challenges, affordability and complexity and risk. Uh, and so we enter into really long-term partnerships with school districts to do our best to help districts with that. And we provide that kind of turnkey solution that Tim uh, was referring to. Um, and that's really what we see as the, the key to addressing the complexity problem is having that turnkey solution. So what, it, what does that mean? This is, this is direct to your, your question, Camille, about how do you help a transportation director who's new to this? You take on everything that's involved with electrification for them um, so that they have one responsible entity for it. So we provide an electrification as a service um, contract um, in which we include all everything that you need to do to electrify a fleet um, in that single package. 
Um, so what does that entail? That entails planning their transition over time um, to electrify. How do you take a fleet, not just do a pilot, but plan a progression over time to fully electrify? Uh, then oversee all of the procurement activities. So when we work with districts, we buy everything for the districts, the buses, the charging infrastructure, the software that connects them, everything. Um, we can also, if the customer would like to buy some of it themselves, we can also facilitate that procurement to so buy it on their behalf um, so that they can own it if they want to. Uh, then we go out and we oversee all the construction and engineering on site. We finance the whole project um, and oversee the installation of all the charging infrastructure that's put in. And then we manage that charging infrastructure over the life of the entire project. So we stay with the district 10 to 15 years. Same length as the, the assets last. The, the bus, bus life is generally, for school buses, is generally a 12 to 15 year asset. Um, so we stay with the districts. It's a classic public-private partnership. We train the maintenance and um, uh, drivers, maintenance staff and the, the drivers and school buses. So there's no change in the uh, employment on site and labor. Um, there's just training on new tech. Um, and then we pay for all the electricity for the project so that the district doesn't have that risk, uh, whether perceived or real, uh, on their side of the fence. Uh, and we pay for all the maintenance work that those maintenance staff are doing on, on the vehicles. Um, so that's the turnkey package. And again, it's, it's to create that one neck to strangle and that one neck is ours, right? So the transportation director is supported um, and has a place to turn. Um, and the contract is set up so that when we work with the district, it's a performance guarantee. So that we're highly incentivized to make sure that project is up and operating at all times. Um, and uh, and providing the service that that we're, we're um, that we're guaranteeing. Uh, so that's the uh, turnkey nature. Uh, again, take that risk, take that complexity off of them. Then there's the affordability. So we create affordability in two ways. One, we eliminate that upfront cost problem by buying everything for the district. That in and of itself solves one challenge, but doesn't create affordability, right? Um, what we do then to create affordability is we stack a bunch of the benefits that electrics can provide that are hard for school districts on their own or their third-party fleet managers to capture. Um, so i just give you two examples. Um, you know, Tim noted that uh, it's cheaper to operate these uh, buses. If they're cheaper to fuel, they're cheaper to maintain. That's hard for districts to take advantage of um, and hard for it to, to really help them because they often have different districts do this differently, but they often have separate capital budgets and operating budgets <laughs> and it can't mix them. And they have a really hard time mixing them for, for a company. That's fine. We can, we, we have very good fidelity on those savings and we can bet on those savings and lower the contract price by those savings to the district. So just pass those savings directly through. We can help them go get all the incentives that they qualify for. We can do all of the uh, work in, with utilities developing V2G programs, demand response programs, et cetera, that can create revenue opportunities. We also are the largest buyer of electric school buses in the country. So we buy at scale and can pass those, those savings through. So there's a bunch of these benefits, seven, eight benefits. That's how you actually create the affordability uh, for the district as well. Um, and the great news is that now with relatively uh, thin incentives, you know, traditional incentives, Tim could tell you the exact numbers that he used to have in 2017, but the traditional incentives were $350,000 to $400,000 for one bus. Now with much lower incentive uh, values, um, we can get many, many school districts around the country to budget neutrality. Um, relative to the cost to own and operate new diesels. Um, and that, of course, is the moment at which a market flips is when the economics line up um, to allow folks to move forward at scale. Thank you, Matt. You've illustrated where Highland fits into this uh, 
into this use case to um, that Tim faced and the different elements that you meet that Tim highlighted. Um, I also note that you highlighted the additional coordination that's necessary within school districts, beyond school districts. And Tim also mentioned this a little bit with air agencies, others as they explore the multiple benefits that are sometimes beyond what a school district's purview and finances are, but the value of the, that coordination as well. So Matt, we're gonna come back to you, but thank you for that explanation of Highland Electric and that use case. And we are going to shift over to speak with Anne Shu of Electro Tempo. Hello, Anne. Hi, Camille. So Anne, can you explain a little bit about your company and how you guys fit in this landscape that we've uh, articulated and talked about here today? Sure. Well, thank you for the opportunity. A little bit about ourselves. We're a software company. We, um, we're a spinoff out of Texas A&M Transportation Institute. So our um, original purpose of spinning this out from the academic uh, environment is to unlock the tremendous ad, um, advances in um, algorithm development and computing power and apply it to vehicle electrification. So what we do is to use software and advanced analytics to reduce the complexity that, uh, that all of my fellow panelists have talked about and um, to take away you know, a lot of the things that we have discussed so far, such as cost benefit analysis, engineering analysis, you know, route planning, schedule adjustments. These are currently done by very smart minds and very um, determined people. Um, but Tim also mentioned that one of the most important elements is actually networking, right? That is the part where people do best. And we would like to, we, our software, our purpose of the software is to handle the number crunching side of things and let people do what people do the best is to build coalitions, build the relationships and, and the networks that will enable the, the ecosystem and the actual transition. So thank you for um, getting the slide up, Donna. Um, the, so essentially our software does three things. The first one is economic analysis. The second one is route planning. And the third one is charging scheduling. And I wanna say that these three things are so intertwined. And in the case of electrification, um, it is that co-optimization and that dynamic and iterative process that, that, that underpins the complexity that we have talked about so far. Where for example, Jason talks about the rate structure and giving different rate options and then the different charging schedules the, the prices um, and the cost um, elements are definitely are going to change and then throw on top of that different incentives and grant money. So we have a dynamic module that considers all of those elements to, look, to help um, fleet managers visualize, okay, here are the range of possible costs right, throughout the, the, the vehicle lifetime. Here are the range of payback times, and that actually informs both both sides, the utilities and the, the fleets, to figure out the best option in terms of rates and in terms of incentives um, to move forward. And the route op optimizer, um, again, you know, I think just now Tim mentioned how or originally they looked at the routes and figured out that more than 90 something, 97% of all the routes could be electrified. But then if you move, shuffle the schedule around a bit, um, he was able to do even better than that. So we would, um, so our software would do that part and it's um, using dynamic programming. We would look at the, the routes and how that um, interacts with, with charging, the required charging windows to shuffle the schedule around uh, and maximize the number of electric vehicles that can be uh, transitioned. 
And the same, same idea applies to charging scheduler. This is co-optimized with the route and also the cost of chargers, right? Because whether or not you can get by with a lower power charger has a huge implication on, on costs. And that's and also on the um, on the time that's required for utilities to take on the, that charging power to the grid. So we take into those um, those things into account um, so that we marry all three aspects and create this shared view to facilitate the communication between and coordination between the utilities and the fleets. That's where we come into play. Thanks, Anne, and thanks for explaining that so clearly. So we're going to come back to Anne as well at the end here, but I'm going to shift now to speak with Jeff Ackerman um, from the respondent point of view. And to this point, we've articulated the challenge that fleets, fleet managers face moving from traditional vehicles to electric fleets. We've heard from the utility, a utility perspective, how they could meet these needs. We've from, heard from two different third party providers that fit in differently into this model about how they could meet some of these needs. And so now we're going to hear from Jeff, who is a former regulator in Colorado to provide the perspective from the utility regulator and other uh, decision makers to figure out how to make sense of these different aspects here that we're raising about this electrification uh, transition. So Jeff, you've heard it all. What are some questions and considerations you would expect utility regulators and decision makers to have and want to answer when they are looking at advisory services in these different aspects? Great, thanks, Jamil. Good to be with you. Uh, it's good to have a few minutes of just regulatory talk. I mean, we are the Regulatory Assistance Project, of course. Uh, and I think it's important to an audience that may or may not be uh, regulatory in nature in terms of staff, commissioners, or in people who engage there. There's some great questions coming in. I want to leave time for those. I think to start that, uh, an answer to your question and what are, where the regulatory decision-making folks should be looking is you, you start and you hear about advisory services and you first think this sounds new. It sounds like something that might be new in the regulated utility world in terms of utilities who offer commodity now moving into a service arena. Uh, I had to reflect back as I thought about that myself from my, in my varied career working in the precursor to the, where Jason's at with at Excel when it was public service and realized in the marketing division for years had a group called the key accounts folks. And basically they were doing a version of this, of understanding which parts of their market they needed to stay better engaged with and interact with in a preemptive uh, interactive way. And back then, many years ago, in regulatory talk, that was always seen as a reasonable expense, sort of just and reasonable. And so what the principle for regulators and decision makers think about is that not that this is different, but this is now more overt. This is now coming at regulatory process much more uh, robustly and much more in a comprehensive nature. It also made me think then, if you go back in, in towards our regulatory history, it also has a component of market development. Regulators sometimes bristle at market development and wonder if that's their role or not. But if you think back to our shared history as well, demand side management or energy efficiency, which is something probably all of us now have been through, is, uh, is the essence of market development of a sort tied to regulatory business. And it made me realize, and you heard it in Jason's presentation when he talked about drawing in third-party assessment. Third-party assessment to help uh, fleets is really not that much different than in energy efficiency, energy auditing. And we had to figure out when we put energy auditing into the component of delivering energy efficiency services to people, how do you, who pays for the energy audit? Because the audit in and of itself saves zero energy. It's what happens after the audit. So it's very uh, comparable to that. And we figured that out in DSM, in demand side management, but we, it's getting, again, as I say, it's a slightly more complex thing. So. I think my, my rhetorical comments slash questions also takes you into sort of what do we learn from those past experiences and how do we apply them now to uh, advisory services? How do we appropriately as regulators and decision makers engage when a utility says, I wish to, and I need to engage here. I want to incur costs and I want recovery of those costs, if not possibly earnings on those costs. What is, what is the right regulatory construct to look at those 
And where does the regulatory construct need to change? I think the regulatory process always needs to be thinking about how it evolves. I also take this all back to Jason's slide in the four parts there, because I thought as I looked at that, it sort of beautifully shows the level of discomfort to level of comfort of the regulatory process. I can get very comfortable on the right-hand side with rate design. We only have a hundred plus year history there. Advisory services is the new phenomenon and each interim piece is a various level of comfort, which is an interesting way to look at it. What we're trying to figure out is how to build more comfort and engage utilities in this process. So a couple of key regulatory principles to think about in here is when advisory services come forward in an application, presumably from a utility, it's obviously the same core questions you always go to. What's a reasonable cost and what is a just cost? And then how do you allocate those costs? Who's gonna pay for it and why? And so you can have a narrow interpretation of that and go into sort of who's the cost causer and they should pay. And then you're gonna put all the burden back on the fleet services. That's great and a very narrow construct. We're learning how to be in a more broader arena and say, we're not just making investments to help fleets, we are doing demand creation back to the notion of market, market development. This is the world of demand creation now. And so in today's regular, regulatory construct, this is the recurring theme for all regulators. You have today's costs, which are known and knowable against future benefits, which are speculative and uncertain, but we know they're out there. And how do we get comfortable matching today's costs to future benefits? And those benefits are everything from load to all the way to societal benefits. And at the same time, I think we also need to learn how we're doing this work. And given that what we're asking the utility to do through advisory services is an aspect of a new implication for load forecasting then. And we have to get comfortable with a whole new way to ask utilities, because at the end of the day, we're going to put most of this burden back on the utility as the applicant and say, bring us good starting information. Bring us good information about a new way to think about load. And when you go after these advisory services, are you going after it in a very sort of negative, uh, I mean, a very narrow strategic kind of which part of your future load do you want? Or do you just want maximum growth no matter where it comes from? And do you want the growth on which part of your system and which time of day? It's thus we're getting into a new complexity about understanding load as well. So I think we're, we're having to understand costs and benefits. And then ultimately I would just share as well that we're having to factor in not only this sort of near-term, long-term, but we're having to finally factor in too that we're in this world of uh, how do you deal with customer assistance and asking the utility to engage the customer, not just in delivering a commodity, but in making that relationship a different type of relationship. Uh, and it is the through the engaging of the customer that the utility is making the hard capital asset investment in infrastructure a viable and reasonable asset. You have to blend those two things together to understand why we're doing that. Uh, at the end of the day, I think the last thing too, in putting this onus back on the utility and engaging them effectively as regulators and third parties who are going to intervene, is you're ultimately also, it's always good as a regulator to ask, what is the utility aspiring to do or to be? And how does this new service fit in there? Where are they going in their future sense of themselves? And do you assist them there? Do you nudge them in a certain way of that? Or do you sort of resist some of that? And how do you build that relationship of building the utility of 10 years from now? I think those are all key parts of what the regulatory process is grappling with and needs to kind of take uh, straight on and grapple with further. Thank you, Jeff. Very much appreciate the questions that you are raising. I think this is an area where we will all continue to have questions and figure out different answers as that evolves and uh, things move forward. So at this point, we're going to, I'm going to turn it back over to my colleague, Dave Farnsworth, to ask some of the questions, excellent questions that are coming up in the chat. Dave. Thank you, Camille and Jeff, thanks very much. Um, and Matt, Jason, and Tim, we have a bunch of really interesting questions, and maybe we can get to a couple before the top of the hour. Here's the first one, and it goes out to all of you. My school district is very reluctant, mostly due to high upfront costs, lack of funding, unresponsive local utility, suspicion about new technology, fear that buses won't go up hills, fear that buses won't work in the winter, storage space for athletic equipment, 
lack of availability of buses, lack of knowledge of chargers, suspicion that infrastructure will double already high upfront costs, fear of the unknown, on and on. Yet we live in an air quality non-attainment zone and the community wants to fight to address climate change. What is your advice on how to change the mind of stubborn people? Parentheses, Board of Education, Transportation Director, School Administration, who are wedded to fossil fuel buses all their lives. P.S. Despite all this opposition, we're finally getting one electric bus. So, who would like to? I will give me a call. <laughs> okay, thanks, Tim. Others? So, Dave, we've, we've never heard any of those challenges before. Um, it, that's that's like a greatest hits list. Um, so, uh, I think calling Tim's a great idea, always. Um, but I, I think, uh, in particular, it's a good idea because um, Tim was able to unlock some uh, different ways to think about the value of uh, electric school buses and what they can provide. And, and I think some of those values, um, it, it really helps shift uh, opinions. So uh, you've got to you know, be, it, it's, it's sort of classic advocacy. The nice thing about electric school buses is they provide lots of different kinds of value. <laughs> and so um, they interest different kinds of people. So uh, you know, Tim discovered that his old diesels, uh, Tim, sorry to give this one away, but you've told me it enough times that I remember it just as and it's a good example that his old diesels were so old that they were really struggling to deliver students on time. Um, and that actually hurt the financial bottom line of the schools because the way in which those uh, schools were, were funded was driven on student attendance which is taken in the morning when the students arrive and they have to be on time to be counted. Um, so that was a, a way to interest the school board, uh, a CFO um, that really touched the bottom line of the school district, very different than uh, you know, some of the local advocacy groups and the interests that they have around clean air, children's health, those, those types of issues. So I think it's really starting to break down the, the variety of benefits that electric can provide and who's gonna care about each of those. That, that's how we, we approach these challenges. Thank you, Matt. Others? I also wanted to add, you know, the uh, question, had, uh, question had some mention about both climate change and non-attainment. And I would like to throw in their public health too. I mean, at the end of the day, it's our children that are breathing in the dirty diesel air. So that's one of the things that our software can help address to, to make, make it clear to all, to everyone, the linkages, the co-benefits um, of electrification um, in all three, on all three fronts, climate change, air quality attainment, and public health. And our software draws upon um, peer reviewed open source software that look at the linkage between the reduction of emissions and asthma, asthma cases. So um, that can help articulate some of the um, benefits that are otherwise hidden um, to bring everybody on board. Thanks, Anne, I appreciate that. Also being in non-attainment, is um, makes it really difficult for economic development, which re regardless of political stripes or inclinations is something important to a state. If you're in non-attainment, you can't bring in new businesses and do new things. And so this could help re reduce that challenge. Anybody else? Jason, were you about to say something? It, yeah, just, just wanted to chime in on, on one thought. You know, we could have a big conversation here about you know, public interest theory and, and, and how you move organizations um, to, to support various policies, but you know, at, at the foundation of it, I think what we're talking about here are net benefits. And the, you know, I, I think Matt was talking about stacking all the all the benefits that electric school buses offer. Jeff is talking about the regulatory construct, which can support some of that from the utility perspective. I'm I'm talking about utility um, programs that can help reduce some of these obstacles for customers. And I think it's all in the name 
of positive net benefits. And so that message can change depending on the, the audience, of course. But I think no matter how you look at it, electrification offers benefits kind of across the board. And so we've done modeling for electrification for various duty types across our, our service areas. And what we see is extremely high net benefits from a societal perspective from, from electrification of these larger vehicles, particularly transit buses, which, which school buses aren't too different from. And so specifically thinking about a transit bus, we, we modeled roughly $200,000 of societal um, net benefits. And that's stemming from um, you know, the, the fuel and ongoing cost savings, as well as the emission savings that these vehicles offer. You know, there's also benefits to, to the electric grid because we get to spread out more kilowatt hours over essentially the same base of cost. Yes, there's some kind of marginal make ready and distribution and transmission and generation costs to serve these new vehicles. But if we're incentivizing charging overnight, which school buses and transit buses absolutely can do, there's really not much additional cost to the grid to support these vehicles. And so we start thinking about all, all these benefits to bring to bear. I think you can start convincing people really quickly, whether or not they're the fleet manager, the property services folks, the sustainability folks, the finance folks, there's kind of streams of benefits there. They're gonna to speak to them in particular. And, and that's what I've always tried to highlight as we go around in our various states, engage with state agencies, as well as customers, as well as um, you know, private companies in this space and vendors and partners that we work with. And it, it, it can all come together um, when we have everyone rowing in the same direction. Thank you. So Tim, we're, we're getting near the top of the hour, but I've got a, a, a quick question for you. Maybe it's a quick question, um, sort of in two parts. First, there's a very, just a specific one. Your voice faded out and um, somebody wanted to know, um, can you please discuss the cents per mile for your electric vehicles? And then the, the cents per mile for maintenance, those benefits you articulated. Oh, the, the, the cents per mile on what we're paying for um, electric, can you hear me? Yes. Um, 19. 19 cents a, a kilowatt mile. So, so what we're looking at for maintenance is a 60% plus reduction because it takes less time to the most, a large part of school bus maintenance is inspections. You know, we in California, we have to inspect the bus every 3000 miles or every 45 days. We're able to inspect it in, in about half the amount of time. So those are labor hours. We don't have to purchase oil. We don't have to, to, um, to take the, the old oil and have it hauled off you know, by, a, um, by a, you know, a material management company. These are, are huge um, cost reductions that um, really you don't really see up front to you start analyzing you know, what a diesel bus costs you. Thank you. So we've come to the top of the hour, and, and as I mentioned earlier on, what we do is like to tie a ribbon around this, and then we'll go to extra time um, with more questions, because we have more, and um, our panelists are happy to stick around for that. But if I were to summarize really quickly from a 10,000-foot point of view, um, this stuff is obviously complex. Advisory services help manage that complexity. Um, advisory services come from a variety of providers. Uh, for utility commissioners uh, and staff, uh, we think you should be aware of this and uh, investigate this variety. I'd like to thank our panelists, um, Jeff Ackerman, Ann Shu, Matt, Jason, Tim. Uh, thank you for joining us. And as I mentioned, we're gonna stick around a little bit longer and we've got more questions. It's so artificial, isn't it? We're gonna start right up again. Here are some more questions. Uh, Jason, um, you mentioned benefits and net benefits. There were a couple questions about uh, costs, ratepayer costs. What, what sort of increase in cost to ratepayers um, um, will result from the advisory services you're offering? Right, so, so this, this gets to the, the heart of the, issue, right? And, and Jeff was bringing this up as well. Um, 
you know, we, we need to, every organization responds to incentives, right? And, and so often people say, hey, to get the utility involved, the, the additional kilowatt hour sales should be all that's needed here. And, and to that, I, I kind of have a, a, a couple of responses because I think that that's a useful entryway into this, into this conversation. You know, kilowatt hour sales are, are great, right? We're trying to, we provide a product and service and, and we want to sell more of that. But, but in recent years, that's been changing, right? And oftentimes utilities don't have that throughput incentive anymore for kilowatt hour sales, you know, but not to go down that, that rabbit hole too far, but there are these rate adjustment mechanisms and other kind of sales true ups that sometimes dilute that, that incentive a bit. And so we try to think about, hey, do we want the utility to be supportive of these types of services, even if they're gonna be costly and uh, upfront because we're, you know, it's all in service to these net benefits in the medium and long term. And so for that, I think there's been a couple strategies that, that we've proposed and that some regulator, it has been really receptive in some, in some environments. Some regulators like Jeff in recent years have been very receptive to, the, to these proposals and, and that's fantastic, right? We need to all be rowing in the same direction. And those, those specific incentives are, let's treat these costs of advisory services, not just as kind of program O&M costs that get funneled into you know, utility rates that, that people see month to month. Let's treat them as an incentive. Let's add a little bit of a rate of return on top of these costs so that we have an incentive to get people into our advisory services programs, to get this fleet planning underway. Uh, again, so everyone's rowing in the same direction. I would say an additional incentive that, that's been really helpful from our perspective is we're starting to talk about now in Colorado specifically about a specific advisory services incentive as part of our broader kind of focus on equity within our transportation electrification programs. Some of our programs are very focused on um, our income qualified programs and programs focusing on higher emissions communities. And so advisory services plays a key role there. So what additional incentives can the utility have to focus on those key communities in particular programs to, to provide an even stronger incentive? So I think when you start you know, stacking these incentives, stacking these benefits, as, as Matt was saying, uh, I think it all comes together into really strong incentives for the utility to be able to support the private market in this space. Thank you. A uh, question for Matt. Does Highlands contract look like a PPA, a purchase power agreement? It does. That's a very important question. Um, yeah, it looks at actually a PPA might be the closest analogy for an electrification as a service um, contract uh, because it's a, a single price uh, that's provided in, in our case on an annual basis. Um, for uh, that uh, that guaranteed service uh, over time. Thank you. This is a question for for all of you. Um, Jason just touched on it when he talked about um, when he mentioned equity. He said, "Are there uh, any of you involved in programs? You know, of programs that are working with uh, school districts in overburdened and underserved communities?" Oh. So I'm just going to throw this out. We that's one of the advantages to being able to go electric to to get grant money for electrification, um, and that is a key component to, you know, the success of these programs because people are willing to to share that education to the underprivileged communities, and I believe that Highlands works directly on that. Is that they can go in and help procure grants that. Are available to these underprivileged communities, then fill that gap beyond that. Is that a good analogy, Matt? Yeah, yeah, no, that's right. I mean, we find that um, uh, we, we work with a number of uh, 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 of burden communities, and we find that the the turnkey uh, service is is helpful for them because uh, oftentimes they've faced years of budget cuts one after another after another and that that affects not only their ability to go get buses but also just purely staffing ability um, so access to things like grant writers 
is limited access to staff that can focus on this topic area to understand the technical uh, matter is limited. And so um, we have spent uh, a good uh, amount of time working with uh, folks in more rural communities, um, uh, uh, folks in uh, community. We have one project at uh, the depot. Uh, and this is a, a project under discussion right now. The depot backs up into a housing project. Um, and uh, so you can imagine what the cloud of diesel fumes is like for, for folks living in, in, that, in that project. Um, so we're spending lots of time doing financial analysis uh, for these communities, helping in some cases uh, co-ops. I know this is a conversation probably principally for uh, folks in uh, IOU territories, but um, for munis and co-ops, uh, right now, they're trying to figure out how to um, help uh, get communities access to these vehicles for not only the health benefits uh, and educational benefits that they provide, but also uh, the uh, the local economic development uh, benefits, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so, uh, we do spend uh, quite a bit of time with uh, with folks in in, uh, in muni and co-op territories that are often working with uh, with disadvantaged communities. Hey Dave, can I jump in a minute there? Please. Yeah. Um, when we had Excel's uh, transportation electrification program in front of the commission back when I was still on the commission, and we dealt with aspects of of equity and, and proposals put forward both by the company and other parties, I think one of the first things that's important to realize in this conversation, and it's important for all regulators, including most of the parties, to realize, and I had to realize it personally is I'm a white male of privilege. So I have to start with the realization I know nothing about the community that I'm trying to bring into the conversation. So I think you have to put that out there first. And then from that vantage point, say, how do I learn who is going to inform me as to what exactly that community needs? For example, we had a large, uh, robust discourse about uh, rebates for purchasing electric vehicles. How is that worked into a low income community? How likely are they to purchase new vehicles versus used vehicles, for example? How do we look at that they may, may be a greater used vehicle market, or that may be a greater market that works much more through public mass transit? How do I thus make sure the mass transit that supports them is electrified and the like? So I think it was important to kind of have that vantage point on that discourse. And that was in the space of community services. Where should infrastructure be? less about well and it does go into fleets it goes into uh, public fleets uh, but and then tangentially into advisory services thank you jeff and i i i know that you when you were at texas a and m did a lot of research on the um and you mentioned public health earlier on did a lot of research on the air quality implications of um, electrifying Fleet. I wonder if you could take a few minutes and, and talk with us about what you learned in your work in Houston. Sure. Uh, thank you, Dave. We learned in our, so I know today, so far, we've talked a lot about um, school buses, but we, you know, fleets, there are also a lot of truck fleets out there, bus, transit bus fleets. And what we've learned when we looked at just medium and heavy duty vehicle electrification in general, in Houston is that when we, if, if and when, when um, we can electrify medium and heavy duty vehicles, they have, um, they provide a lot of health, public health benefits for the lower, the disadvantaged communities because of the reduction of on-road tailpipe emissions and the fact that a lot of low income and disadvantaged neighborhoods um, uh, are right next to the highways. So I think in going back to Jason's point about net positive benefits, I think that is a portion, that is one thing that, um, you know, a lot of times so far we've talked about the electrification emissions benefits. A lot of times it's about aggregate. I think if we look at the actual distribution and spatial, spatial allocation of these emissions, the benefits of emissions reductions, we'll see that they actually do benefit disadvantaged um, communities more. Um, and that um, the second point I would like to make in addition to the spatial distribution is that um, now we actually have the capability through because of 
ad um, algorithm advancements to, to not only look at the aggregate emissions reductions, but also look at the, the distribution and monetize, you know, go down to the neighborhood level, measure the savings on medical costs um, from the savings of reductions, uh, emissions reductions, so that it actually brings the uh, brings um, all of the benefits to a level ground that informs um, everybody um, involved, especially the regulators in terms of looking at um, how much exactly the, the net benefits are. And so when we actually can go down to the population level and look at health benefits and monetize that, um, that, um, that that's where the benefits of electrification of medium and heavy duty vehicles really, sh really shines. Thank you. This is a question for all of you. Uh, I'm interested in where outages fit into the picture of electric school bus adoption. Is resiliency a component the of the infrastructure planning here? What is the charging infrastructure and charging cycles? How do the uh, infrastructure and charging cycles uh, reflect the need for resiliency for maintaining service in the face of extended outages? I have one, one thing to say about the beginning of it. Um, electrical outages don't do anything different than when you um, don't have electricity to pump fuel, whether it's CNG or diesel. Um, an outage is, is an outage. It's whatever you have left in your tank. But there's another solution to that too, is that you can do solar and stationary batteries which we're going to start doing, which will allow for that resiliency. Not looking at putting a generator in, uh, we're looking at putting, you know, um, stationary batteries in that will allow us to charge buses when the grid's down. But if you look at the reliability of the grid, uh, unless you're in PG&E territory and fire territory, the grid's up most of the time. Thank you. Other comments? It makes a great set of points. I, I would only echo that, you know, many of our customers were talking with them about, you know, on-site renewables, on-site storage um, for exactly those, those reasons. It all depends on um, what kind of um, project the, uh, the school district uh, is interested in taking on what their, the characteristics they're looking at for that, uh, that school district. Um, and their, their overall long-term goals and the economics of the project. Thank you. Yeah, and, and just one, one interesting piece I, I wanted to bring to this conversation is, you know, of course, as, as Tim and, and Matt were saying, you know, the, the grid is up more than 99.9% .9 of the time. Um, but obviously for, for when you're depending on that for, for your vehicle charging, that, that becomes all the more important. And so we're, we're running some pilots now to get a better sense of how we can be timing the charging of vehicles more dynamically in response to what the grid needs. And so, hey, if there are kind of rolling um, curtailments through various neighborhoods during those kind of hot summer peak days, how can we think of vehicle charging as that key resiliency item? And so we, we've got a, a program in, in Colorado, again, a, a real leader in this space uh, that we call Charging Perks. And it, it's partnering with, with us, the OEMs, as well as customers. So we bring to bear kind of day ahead forecasts on what the grid's gonna look like and need hour by hour. The OEMs have information on the drivers and their charging needs and driving needs. And so all that is combined into an algorithm that adjusts charging in real time, toggles the rate, stops charging, um, or starts it, depending on those, those price signals and driver preferences. And we think that's not only really important for the grid at large, thinking about the generation and transmission system, but as we get more and more granular with these types of pilots, we can be optimizing for the conditions on the distribution grid more and more. And we think this just opens up a, a ton of value, both for us and, and as well as customers. Thank you. This is a related question I toss out to, to all of you, uh, is related to what we're talking about today. Um, goes like this, some utilities are now proposing innovative financing concepts like battery purchase programs 
that would be paid off with fuel and maintenance savings. What are panelists? So, so Duke Power reached out to me and that was one of their concepts back in North Carolina that I think that, that it is a possibility, um, but I don't think anybody has really created kind of a, of a model of it yet, but they're talking about it. It is something. Okay. You, uh, Tim, Tim, you broke up a little bit there. If you could just repeat that last part of what you said, I apologize. So, so I think it, it's an option. It's an option that utilities are thinking about. Um, I don't think anybody's even developed a pilot for that yet, but I did talk to a gentleman out at Duke Power in North Carolina about that. Um, it would be good at that point. And then after the battery you know, gets to its useful life, it can then be replaced and then um, it can be repurposed for something else. It is a concept that I think we're going to see some um, people develop it down the road. Thank you. Any other takers? Okay. We the, the the topic of data came up here and there in 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 these presentations. Um, I'm curious what types of data are being collected as part of this work today, uh, and what types of data are not being collected but should be collected. We're collecting 150 data points. This will be a, a topic for another discussion. But um, I think that you need to collect every bit of data you could get. And then, but it's one thing to have this massive data, but you need to then focus on what's the most useful data for moving, moving this technology forward. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, real-time uh, telematics and tracking um, on all of our buses you know, so we can see the full nationwide and up into Canada fleet uh, at any time and, and operating characteristics and, and performance. Um, but to Tim's point, you, you got to be uh, you got to be set up to uh, be crunching the numbers um, uh, on an ongoing basis um, to really facilitate their use for decision making. I would like to chime in um, that sometimes like um, our, our software, a key, um, a, you know, a key capability um, is that we can work with the lack of data. And that is something that we've noticed with um, sometimes a lot of fleet or a lot of fleets we've talked to actually don't have telematics and they, um, you know, maybe they just have a spreadsheet and um, we got to be able to help them help those fleets too to, to get started, even if they just have a set of spreadsheets. And that's where um, I think predictive analytics come into play and uh, simulation comes into play because there is only so much, so many electric uh, vehicles in operations right now, and there's only so much um, information one can gather. And for those of us, for those fleets that that have not, you know, gotten as far in terms of the actual, you know, data the data gathering, I think uh, using some simulation and synthetic data to get that process jump started. Um, to start coordinating, uh, start that conversation with utilities to, sh to show what a potential charging schedule and charging demand may look like. I think that's also a crucial part of um, the data conversation. Thank you. You know, Dave, I would also add, uh, data is such a critical part of not only utility performance and utility regulation, that to part of what Jason was sharing earlier, that we're we're moving into a new world of utility incentives for asking them to do certain things different from the norm and then compensating them accordingly. And again, learning from demand side management, data is what got us over the hump of trusting that a certain type of uh, rebate delivered into a certain part of the market would yield certain customer behavior in terms of reduced usage. Now we're on the other end of that spectrum saying, we need to build comfort 
that a certain amount of investment with a certain rate design, with a certain focus in a certain market will yield uh, additional load and additional customer utilization. So we can build that connection over today's investment and a future benefit to the grid. And then you have that data that gives us confidence so that then we know how to appropriately compensate the utility and decide was that in fact a just and reasonable investment and then how to do a complete uh, kind of feedback loop of our decision-making process. Thank you, Jeff. Any other thing, any other responses uh, regarding data? Those are great points. Um, as utilities start this work, are there especially critical pieces that they should start with? These are for the utilities that are, that are thinking about doing this or improving improving their game. As they start this work, are there things they should really start with as they put together advisory services? That, that's a great question. I, I would say, uh, you know, talk, talk to your stakeholders, talk to your regulators. You need to talk informally, I think first, to really think about, well, you know, what direction do we all, all want to be going in? Hopefully it's the same direction, right? And, and it really helps, as I was saying earlier, having everyone rowing in that same direction. So, so start by talking informally, setting principles. That can give good guidance and direction for utilities to then go back and develop some programs to, to meet some of those, those overarching principles. Um, but, but at the end of the day, right, ut utilities need to um, propose programs that are going to work for their customers and be successful in, in the regulatory process. And so you have to adapt that to, to every local um, jurisdiction, every, every condition. Um, a one size fits all approach is, is not what works here. Other thoughts? Jeff, I, I would imagine you have some thoughts there. Yeah, no, I think, I think, uh... Jason covered it well, though, uh, and, and I, I think especially I, I think you can't articulate enough in the nature of the regulatory world we live in, where everything, well, the world we live in, regulatory or otherwise, how everything quickly becomes litigious and becomes one right answer and uh, is if the more you can do early and informally and in an arena where we are just sharing ideas, the more you're going to get over 100 years of history of the regulatory construct and kind of say, okay, we know this is difficult on you as regulators and you on utilities and you on consumer advocates and you on policy advocates and the like, but the more we can have a discourse early on behind closed doors, if need be, that says, let's throw ideas back and forth and see where we're going. The better a chance you have of bringing something later in front of the commission that just doesn't get bogged down in crazy rhetoric and actually goes forward and makes some good policy program and practice. Stage advice, thank you, Jeff. So we're getting down near the end of this half hour. I'd like uh, to give each of you a chance to, um, you know, just take a little time and, and uh, summarize your observations here on what you've heard, what you think the audience ought to be thinking about. Um, this is a freebie. You guys get to say whatever it is you'd like. Maybe we'll start, um, can we start with you, Matt? Is that okay? Yeah, I can just say, you know, uh, as you as you look at the folks assembled here um, and you, you think about others that are out there, this this space has changed a lot over the last you know, three, four years. There are folks don't don't have to uh, try and repeat Tim's exercise um, of, of really having to do this on their own. Um, and, uh, whether you're working with a company like Highland or, you know, getting advice from your utility, like, uh, Jason's team offers, we, we work with them. They've been great, uh, with projects in Colorado. Um, you know, uh, there are nonprofits out there, uh, helping folks, uh, as well. Um, and obviously there are other kinds of companies who are out there helping with pieces of this along the path. There are a lot of tools and, and support out there today. Um, and so I think the, the main message is don't be afraid of this. It is complicated. It is, it, 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 there, are, there are issues to solve, um, but there are lots of tools out there now. You can go at this much faster today than you could have uh, three, four years ago. And I encourage everybody to get started. At the end of the day, 
The message is these buses provide tremendous value um, to communities in many different ways. Um, they're a wonderful asset to have. People, when they have them, love them and they want more of them. Um, and uh, that's the message I would take away. Don't be afraid, just get started. There, there are people out there to help you now. Thank you. Tim. Well, I would say, and I would say that, that that's exactly what you need to do. And somebody to help. Don't, don't try to take the project on all by yourself and think that one or two electric buses, that's gonna be this great thing. Electrify your fleet, plan for the future, plan to go big, because once you start using them, you're gonna wish your whole fleet was electric. Thank you. Jason. Yeah, so the closing thought here would be, um, you know, as, as Tim and Matt are saying, there's resources out here to, to help folks along this journey. You know, our pitch would be, you know, engage early and often with your, your utility. Hopefully they're as um, forward leaning on all this stuff as, as we're trying to be. But I think that early engagement leads to our success and be able to electrify these sites to the level that that's contemplated in whatever that fleet's electrification plans are, as well as helping the customer have that confidence that, hey, when, when the actual infrastructure and charging stations are, are installed, that we're gonna be able to energize this and be off to the races. So that, or that early planning, that early conversations are, are hugely valuable. Um, and, and hey, you know, if we can be helping on these advisory services, great. If you're choosing other providers, that's great too. If you're choosing other equipment providers for the charging stations, you know, not offered through some of our programs, that's great. You know, I think it's all about people bringing solutions to the mix here. We think we have a role as that trusted energy provider, but if we can be pointing folks in the right direction, um, you know, providing a, a baseline level of service um, for those kind of needing some of that help, so needing some of those turnkey solutions, that's great. Thank you. Anne? Yeah. Well, so I think a key theme um, coming out of this webinar is that every as communications across multiple stakeholders. And um, to echo my fellow panelists, there are tools and resources out there now. And we, you know, as a software provider, we provide the framework that translates vehicles and routes into chargers and peak demand to bring the different parts together. Um, and we also provide a consistent cost benefit framework to allow all parties, right, utilities, fleets, and regu regulatory bodies to de determine what solution meets the mission and financial requirements. So um, we, that's where I think we fit in and uh, we strive for is to facilitate that communication and accelerate this um, electrification transition. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank all of, all of our panelists today. Uh, Tim Shannon, Jace Bouquet, Ann Shu, Matt Stanberry, Jeff Ackerman. Thank you all. You've been really terrific um, and you've really illuminated lots of things here that um, illumination. I wanna thank you. Um, I guess I, I end up with my same sort of summary observations that this complexity can be managed Advisory services can be really helpful here. There are lots of providers out there and regulators, we encourage you to make sure you're aware of that and, and um, investigate this variety. Uh, with that, on behalf of Camille and Jeff and Donna, thank you all for uh, joining us today. This has been, uh, this has been a, a, a really helpful webinar. I hope you have um, a great weekend. <laughs>